You know, there's some very unwise people among us. I've got to be honest. They foolishly believe that they are called to do battle with the devil. They approach me periodically. They think their ministry is to run around delivering people from the devil. And many of them, of course, have been taken by him in the process. I'm speaking today about Jesus' encounter with the enemy. And I'd like to read to you by way of introduction Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself, that is Jesus, likewise also partook of the same. That through death, now my version's rather interesting here, I'm reading the New American Standard, it says, through death he might render powerless. Anyone have a different uh, translation there? He might destroy. Anything else? I like my translation pretty well because destroy to me has a ring of finality about it and I know that finally that will be the case. But the enemy is actually very much alive and well today. And I'm choosing to believe that he's been rendered powerless. Rendered powerless through the atoning death of Jesus Christ. So I don't need to spend my life fighting the devil. I do hope you hear this this morning. Of course, when I'm confronted by people taken by the devil, I will act and see that deliverance happens. But this is not the focus of our ministry. We are to be focused on Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And it's the lifting up of Jesus that draws sinners to Him. So there are two things I've learned painfully that I'm not called to do. One is to spend my life doing battle with the devil. I'm to move into faith in the name of Jesus and believe that he is absolutely powerless. And secondly, I'm not called to spend my life struggling against sin. praying that self-defeating prayer, God, make me strong enough not to do it again. As I dig the hole deeper and deeper and keep on doing it again. There's only ever been one person in human flesh who was strong enough to overcome sin and the devil. And I've got news for you this morning, it wasn't me. It was the Son of Man Himself and what a transformation it is, instead of struggling against sin, to actually put on the mind of Jesus every day of our lives. I don't know why I was so slow in these matters. It took me years to realize that it's not me getting a little more holy every day with a shot in the arm from God. It's Jesus in me who is not attracted to sin. It's Jesus in me, <clears throat> excuse me, who is drawn to righteousness and holiness. My challenge <clears throat> is to be in Jesus every day of my life. It's a faith challenge. Because when Jesus is in me, I find sin is becoming so unattractive. But if in my, I'm in my natural state, it's very attractive. We all know that. How's your faith this morning? 
So Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. He was in a weakened condition, but spiritually, never more alert. He'd just been baptized by the Spirit, and this means, as we just saw with Esther, this means he was to begin his God-ordained ministry. And he's about to embark on his ministry, and the enemy draws out his bow, and he goes ping, ping, ping and shoots three big arrows at Jesus. And because Jesus is representing us, we know that these three temptations have great significance for us. Open your Bibles with me this morning to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We can learn so much from how Jesus dealt with the enemy. And if you're in ministry and you're anointed by the Spirit, the enemy has his bow drawn on you and wants to shoot his arrows at you. So please learn from the experience of Jesus. I'm fascinated how he dealt with the enemy. Absolutely fascinated. Look at the first temptation. Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now Jesus had just been fasting for how long? I find if I fast for four days, I think I'm going to die. Jesus fasted for 40 days. I guess we could say he hungry. And the tempter recognizing this as a weakness, not just a physical weakness, but he's assuming that it's also pulled Jesus down emotionally, spiritually, and in every respect, how wrong he was. And so he shoots his first dart. Command these stones to become bread. But you know, it's much more than hunger that's being addressed here. Because by tempting Jesus to turn the stones into bread, he was tempting him to exercise his self-reliance. And that independence that rears its ugly head in every one of us. And I hear people saying it so frequently, but I, I have the right to have my needs met. I mean, I'm a human being too. I have needs. I hear it every day of my life. I hear it from people who are in ministry. I hear plans being made that are made because they suit me rather than to the glory and the honor of God. It's not convenient for me. There used to be a time when it was a joy to sacrifice for God. They try and call a missionary today and they're going to ask him, well, is there air conditioning? I mean, what are the facilities there? I wish I'd known about air conditioning when I got called to New Guinea. I went into a house that had no electricity, no running water, with a six-week-old baby. There's some well-intentioned friends in Australia, they sent a water heater out to the world's most impractical missionary. They sent me a water heater, a cylinder, like round like this and about six or eight feet tall with another little cylinder that went with it, which I had no idea what to do with. I can never get the water to run because it never occurred to me that the smaller cylinder had to be higher than the bigger one. (coughs) But I spent days, weeks, and months getting pipes, attaching it to the kitchen sink. I said, at least we'll have hot water in the kitchen sink. I was very proud. This is the first practical thing I ever remembered achieving. I actually connected the heater up and there was a small firebox at the bottom of the heater 
And you had to light a fire in there, and that apparently would heat the water. So I wondered if I lit the fire, maybe the water would start flowing. If I made one big mistake, I'm on a mission compound 300 miles from anywhere, in the middle of a New Guinea jungle, surrounded by cannibals, and here's this mission station. And I made the mistake of announcing to all the people who lived on the mission station, Sunday morning, I'm going to have a dedication service and I'm going to light the fire. Because they'd all been watching me with great hilarity install this water heater. You know, it's the missionaries that provide most of the fun for the people in these countries. <laughs> and they loved the fact that I was so klutzy, that gave them great humor. And so I was already, Sunday morning, I was up bright and early, and I looked out and there's like two or three hundred people on the grass outside the back of the house, all waiting for the big event. And it was pouring with rain. You haven't seen rain. You think you've got rain in Seattle. We were getting 400 inches a year. I don't like rain that much, do you? Luckily, it was hot as well as wet. We only had two seasons, hot and wet and hotter and wetter. I kept a small rowboat outside my back door because sometimes on one day you'd get 20 inches of rain. You had to row out. You couldn't walk out. And I said, well, I'm going to do the fire anyway because there's 300 people out there. They don't want to miss the show. Of course, I had no idea about what kind of show I was about to give them. I'm wearing just a little pair of short pajamas. And I decided I won't even get changed. I'm going to get wet through. So I walk out and get totally drenched. And even the wood is wet. And I put the, wet in, the wood in the firebox and I stuffed paper in there, and the paper burned up, but the wood wouldn't catch. So having failed to learn the most basic lessons about flammable liquid, I mean, I'd already burnt down the store and the garage and other things. The mission actually voted I should live in a thatched hut. Because <laughs> if it got burnt down, there'd be no loss. <laughs> so I, I went to a place where I had a gallon drum of kerosene. The natives, of course, are crowding around enjoying this moment immensely. They know what's going to happen, I don't. <laughs> and I opened the little fire door and I threw in the whole gallon of kerosene. <laughs> it's a miracle I survived the mission field. <laughs> And apparently there were some sparks in there <laughs> because there was an explosion that could be heard, I'm sure, a mile away, like a backfire. And out it came, the fire. And I saw 300 people fall on the ground. And in New Guinea, they go like this when they're laughing hysterically, you know. <laughs> I say, what's so funny, you know? And I looked down and my pajamas had been burnt totally off me. <laughs> And I'm standing there in all my glory <laughs> before the pastors and their wives and their children. <laughs> I think you could say they saw their leader from a totally new perspective, you know. <laughs> I'll never forget I ran into the house because my chest was actually on fire. My skin was burning and I ran in and my wife had her back to me. She was at the kitchen sink. She had the tap on not knowing that it would never flow. <laughs> And I said, quick, I'm on fire. And without even turning around, she said, well, what's new? <laughs> I said, I'm literally on fire. <laughs> well, that's, I don't know how I got into that, forgive me. <laughs> how did that story come up, by the way? <laughs> Oh, okay. I can't believe that story. I wasn't planning to tell it. Okay, well, it's out now. <laughs> you have the bare facts now of the story. <laughs> so this is not about hunger alone. This is about self-sufficiency. 
And I confess to you this morning, I am a very self-sufficient person. I'm the kind of person you could drop anywhere in the world with no money and I would survive. I'm just one of those people. It wouldn't even bother me. <laughs> I would enjoy the challenge of doing it. Self-sufficiency. Turn these stones into bread. You feed yourself. It's okay. You're hungry. Of course, he was tempting Jesus to use his own power in his own behalf. But the principle is the same when he tempts us, isn't it? Rely on yourself. Trust in your own ability. If you've got it within you, you've got the potential, you've got the ability, just tap into it. It's a very humanistic kind of philosophy because the only person left out of it is God and his spirit within us. John the Baptist was called the greatest man ever born of woman because he simply said, I must decrease. And if you want to be in ministry, you want that anointing of the spirit, I has to be crucified every single day. And the good news this morning is, in Romans 6, we're told that I was crucified with him. I died in his death. His death was my death to sin. I don't get rid of my old carnal nature by beating it up every day or pushing it down or begging God to take it away from me. It's an act of faith. If I come to the cross and I see the atoning death of Jesus as having been accepted as my death to sin, that is my death to sin. I claim Romans 6.11 every morning of my life. Paul says, consider yourself to be dead to sin and alive unto God. Not because you're feeling a little more holy this morning, but because Jesus died and rose again and he has been accepted by the Father incredibly as me. That is the amazing grace of God, isn't it? I hope when you left your tent or your your trailer or your home this morning, that by faith you took hold of the atoning death of Jesus so that self was crucified again today in his death. And because of his resurrection, you also have been raised from the dead and can walk forth today in newness of life. How's your faith this morning? Self gets all in the way all the time in ministry, you know. All the time. I had a telephone call from a young man at Atlantic Union College in Boston. I'd met this kid when I was over there. And he said to me, I've started dating this girl on campus. I said, okay. He said, she's not a Christian. I said, so? You're a theology student and you're dating a girl who's not a Christian. He said, actually, she comes out of some strange Indian cult. Her father's a priest in it. He said, I'd like to witness to her and lead her to Christ. I said, noble intentions. Very noble. So let me give you the greatest wisdom you could ever hear on this subject. And believe me, this is serious wisdom. If you want to help this young woman to grow spiritually, you must be strong enough to not try and have a relationship with her. There's a deathly silence on the telephone. Because if you get emotionally involved with this girl, or God forbid, you get physically involved with this girl, her decision will no longer be based upon a love for Jesus Christ and what the Father has done through his Son 
her decision will have more to do with the fact that she's now enjoying a relationship with you. And please, whatever you tell me in the future, don't try and tell me that this is love. Because love never puts another person in a situation that is not in their best interest. You know that, don't you? I said, are you hearing me? He hesitated. And I've known this kid a long time. I said, I'm going to say it again. Self will not predominate in this decision. It's not about me. It's about Jesus having his way with this young woman. Because we didn't know at this point that her parents were about to tell her that if she had a relationship with this young man, they would commit ritual suicide. And they would do it. So what did he do? He moved into a relationship with this young woman. I mean, in every respect, he crossed the line. So he called me up to tell me the sad news. I said, well, unfortunately, you've lost the right to call me. I'm no longer available. He said, you're the only person I can talk to. I said, you've lost that right. I'm not taking your phone call. You have no care about this girl whatsoever. You don't care what happens to her spiritually. You have deliberately put your own needs ahead of her spiritual growth. I don't want to know you, I'm sorry. And so for two years he called me and I didn't take his call. But recently God said to me, you can take a call from him now. I said, two years have gone by, he's still calling me. Thank God for caller ID. And God said to me when I was praying, you can take a call from him this week. And so I took his call, he was very surprised. Anyway, he was graduating, so I agreed to go over to graduation and support him. So I went over there, and it was Sabbath morning. We went to the Sabbath service together. I was hungry, because I'd flown across the country, and I hadn't had any breakfast. I'm a breakfast person. I don't care about the rest of the day. By the way, on Sabbath here, the Fijian community put on a Fijian island feast for me. I told them I'd only come if it was all Fijian food. <laughs> Fabulous feast. Thank you, Fijians. That was so good. <laughs> anyway, uh, this young man says to me, I'm just such a mess. The girl has broken up with me. I said, well, she's shown a little more character than you have, apparently. She cannot afford for her parents to kill themselves. She won't do it. I said, I understand that. I said, she would have had to have been a born-again Christian to stand against that. Wouldn't she? What a tragedy she isn't. He said, I'm just hurting so much. Would you go for a walk with me around the lake? I said, okay. So we go walking around that beautiful lake nearby the college there. And we sit down on a grassy knoll and he opens up and he shares with me and says, I'm just dying inside. I mean, I'm in such pain and agony. I said to him, I want to tell you something. This is a serious thing I'm laying on you now. If you want my involvement and my help in your life from now on, I want you to know that you do not have the luxury of self-pity. Oh, he said, you're so tough, you're so hard. I said, you have no idea how much I care about you. I'm going to say it again, you do not have the luxury of self-pity. You know, I'm, I am meeting so many people who are consumed with self-pity. How tough things are for them. How difficult it is for them to make it. How bad their relationships are. How nothing ever seems to go right. So I said it to him a third time. You don't have the luxury of self-pity. He said, why not? He finally came out with it. I said, because you are hurting because of the stupidity of your own actions. You chose to go in violation of every biblical principle. 
and thought you could have your way with this young woman and still have the blessing of God in your life. You put your needs ahead of her spiritual growth and now she's back in the Indian cult. And she had a heart and a hunger for God. She's lost it. So I don't look at me and tell me to be sorry for you because I don't feel it. This is a serious principle here. When the devil said to Jesus, turn these stones into bread, he was saying, let your own needs come to the surface. Spend your life and ministry making sure that your needs are taken care of. It's like Paul said on one occasion, there are those with you whose interests are not those of God's or the kingdom of God. They have allowed self to rise to the surface. How did Jesus meet this temptation, by the way? By the way, the young man repented. He's coming out to stay with me shortly, and he's prepared to grow in the grace of God. I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Tough love, huh? Tough love. Please don't be weeping your way through life because you're living in violation of the principles of God's word. We don't have the luxury of, of, of self-pity in that respect. How did Jesus handle this temptation? <clears throat> Jesus had his priorities crystal clear. It is <clears throat> written. It is written. Jesus fell back on the word of God every time he encountered the devil. Have you noticed that? He doesn't try and do battle with the devil. He doesn't try and argue with him or prove him wrong. Jesus doesn't even try and defend himself. I love that. He simply says, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I uphold this to you this morning. Whenever the enemy shoots a dart, make a distinctive choice to simply stand upon it is written and remind him that I'm not living by bread alone. I've got other priorities in my life. And my number one priority is to do the will of him who sent me. Thus, every word that he has written, that is what matters to me. You can do whatever you like to me, but like Martin Luther said, here I stand. And we would have some great soldiers for Christ if they would just remember that we're not called to do battle with the devil because he is already defeated why would you go to battle with a foe who's already been defeated I saw a, a sign outside a church <laughs> I'll never forget it it said uh, when the devil reminds you of your past remind him of his future <laughs> I love that I love that when the devil reminds you of his past remind him of his future we need men and women young people today who take a stand on the word of God despite any needs that they may be feeling personally physically, emotionally, spiritually financially we could throw that in today they choose to stand on thus saith the Lord. This is how Jesus met the enemy. Head on. No arguing. No self-defense. No explanations. Simply, it is written. And I believe as we draw closer to the end now, more urgently than ever, we're going to be called to simply say, it is written. I have nothing to defend myself with, simply to do the will of my Father in heaven and live by every word which proceeds out of his mouth. 
How's your feet this morning? Mm. By the way, if you're self-centered and you try and enter into ministry, the one thing lacking will be compassion. Self-centered people can't generate love. They're too busy being concerned about themselves. And I've got news for you. Self-centered people who are lacking in love and compassion, when they deal with burning issues within our churches, division is the result. I've seen it over and over again. I've seen self-centered people put into positions of responsibility and they deal with burning issues with, with churches face today. And the result? Division instead of unification because their hearts are not filled with the love and compassion of God. I need the mind of Jesus desperately every day. How about you? So my natural self-reliant instincts do not kick in. And the mind of Jesus can prevail. Look at the second temptation. Interesting temptation here. Verses 5 through 7. So the devil takes him up into, a high, into the holy city of all places and takes him to stand on the pinnacle of the temple, the highest point of land in Jerusalem. And the temple, the most magnificent building takes him right up to the top of the temple and had him stand on the pinnacle and tempts him now by saying in verse 6, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Pretty clever foe, isn't he? It is written. Oh, what a strategist he is, huh? He saw how Jesus fell back on that, so he throws it in himself now, hits Jesus with it. For it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now what a temptation this was, huh? I call this the temptation to be spectacular. Jesus was not a stunt man. He didn't seek to be a star of a shepherd. Not at all. I feel sad today that so many who are anointed by the Spirit and move into ministry, they seem to think unless they're doing something spectacular or something out of the ordinary, they're not being successful. I want to tell you that any moment of your life when you see a sinner convicted of sin, you see a sinner fall on their face in repentance, and you see the arms of God close around them and pick them up and stand them on their feet and say to them, I love you. You are my son, you are my daughter, I'm going to put my spirit within you. You will no longer be a slave to sin. When I see those moments in life, I look up and say to the Father, thank you. These are the most exciting and beautiful moments in ministry. We even have pastors today, unless they can have a super church, as it's called, they don't feel successful. I want to urge upon you this morning that if your church is a place where Jesus is uplifted, where his death is celebrated, where his life is experienced, where sinners can find a refuge and forgiveness and restoration from their sins, then you are doing as much to glorify God as anybody else on this earth. That's all that God requires, and the receptive people in the community will be led to you to find peace in their heart. That's why Jesus didn't yield to the temptation to do something spectacular and turn himself into a stunt man. How did he, in fact, answer the enemy here? Again? 
It is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And I urge you to consider this morning that if Jesus is in you, Who is actually being tempted? I want you to think about it. You might start thinking, well, I'm really being tested here, tempted, you know. I'm going to say it again. If Jesus is in you, the enemy is going to be shooting his arrows at Jesus and using you as the vehicle to try and bring him down. I was having a laying on of hands in a church some time ago and a young man who was being anointed by the Spirit grinned at me and said, uh, I hope you realize, he's saying this to me, I've just been teaching and he says to me, I hope you realize that as God anoints me with the Holy Spirit today, he will actually be anointing his own son who happens to be in me because Jesus needed to be anointed by the Spirit every day of his life. I said, thank you for saying that. I said, that is a thought that I had not really seriously addressed before. It was such a profound moment. So he said, when you lay hands on me, it'll be the Father anointing the Son in me. And because I'm his channel, I'll have the benefit now of the anointed life of Jesus in me for another day. I thought, wow. That is such a Christ-centered perspective, isn't it? Because even for something as beautiful as the anointing of the Spirit, we're tempted to think, well, now I'm anointed, you know? I finally got it. And all along, it's Christ in me, relating to his Father again within me. Wow. How's your faith this morning? So Jesus was not called into the spectacular. His ministry was quietly done. He moved throughout the countryside, not making a big noise. How many times did Jesus actually address the multitude? You could count on one hand the times he actually spoke publicly. Most of his ministry was individual encounters with individuals or little groups of persons. As he Jesus spent three and a half years in ministry basically with 12 people. 12 people. Out of all the thousands of people in Judea and Galilee, he spends the bulk of his time with 12 raggedy men. Because he was discipling them. And he knew that after his passing, they would be the ones who would carry forth his ministry with him now in them. One of the things I've learned about shepherding is the thought in John 10, 14, where Jesus said that the shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep know, I don't know if you've ever worked with sheep, uh, my father-in-law is a sheep rancher in Australia, on the west coast of Australia, and I spent many summers working with the sheep and they are such crazy creatures, believe me. Crazy creatures. So one summer I was on my father-in-law's ranch, beautiful ranch, beginning in the rolling hills and running all the way down onto the, the Indian Ocean, just a gorgeous place, gorgeous place. He has five miles of beach just along his own property there. And you can sit at the breakfast table and see the kangaroos gracefully bounding through the fields as they trample your crops and break your fences, you know? <laughs> Such a beautiful sight it is, beautiful sight. Anyway, one summer I was home with my two brothers-in-law, both of whom happened to be pastors. So there's three pastors on the ranch for the summer. I was on leave from the mission field. And my father-in-law said to us, I'd like you to dip the sheep. I said, dip the sheep? What does he mean, dip the sheep? Is it like a baptism or what? I had no idea. But when you dip the sheep, there's a pit full of this horrible oily substance, black and oily and smelly. 
And there's a narrow little way that's called a race, a sheep race. And you somehow or other have to direct the sheep one by one into this narrow little walkway and they go up it and then at the end they drop down into this pit and they hate it because it gets rid of all ticks and infestations that sheep, these are merino sheep, so they've got that really thick wool on them, beautiful wool, but they also pick up many infestations, so they have to be dipped. So we said, well, how many sheep do we need to dip? He said, well, probably in the next four weeks you could probably get through about 50,000. I said, oh, 50,000 sheep. <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to get a mob of sheep, as they call them, to do what you want them to do. If you can picture three pastors with no farming experience. <laughs> and the sheep were running in every direction imaginable. My, my oldest brother-in-law, who's such a character, he stood up here like this and he was going like this, come on, dearies, come on. <laughs> I was getting behind the sheep, pushing them, and they just stubbornly stood there. <laughs> they didn't want to move, and my father-in-law, who was an interesting character, he came down and surveyed this scene, because we'd been there for like two hours, and we hadn't managed to dip one sheep. <laughs> we couldn't even get them into the sheep race. <laughs> so my father-in-law came down. I'll never forget this. And he chooses one big old sheep and he walks up behind it and he goes <laughs> and he kicks it in the backside <laughs> and the sheep goes into the race and what an incredible sight hundreds of sheep just simply followed along I thought oh my goodness <laughs> all you've got to do is to get one sheep in there and everyone else follows <laughs> this is the meaning of sheep and I really started to think about why Jesus chose the, the simile, you know, that he's a shepherd and he's dealing with the sheep. And I began to realize that Jesus is dealing with some pretty tricky customers out here that are called sheep. They're ornery. They don't easily take direction. But when one sets the pace, the others, they all, it wouldn't matter if they were jumping over a cliff, they would have all just followed and every sheep, there are hundreds of sheep just quietly walked and followed him and got dipped one by one. I learned a great lesson here. If you want to be a stunt person, you want to make a big show, you want to be seen as having made a difference. The one thing that you will never get to experience, and it's the most delightful and enjoyable aspect of being called into ministry, which we all are, Where are you? I'm saying it every day. We are all called into ministry, aren't we? This is not just a handful of pastors that are called into ministry. We are all called into the royal priesthood. And the thing you're going to miss, if you want to be out there doing something that will bring attention to yourself, something that people can look at and say, well, he's been successful, you know. He's made a difference. And a lot of people get motivated like this. But if you choose that route, I'm putting you on notice now, the one thing you will miss out on is the joy and the privilege of knowing the sheep intimately. And I want to tell you that's the sweetest aspect. The sweetest aspect of spending your life for God is the quality of of relationships that you build with fellow believers who have the same flesh and blood that you have, but you've been in their home, you've eaten their food, you've sat around the table, you've shared together, you've grown to love and appreciate one another. They are the sweetest moments in ministry. And you miss this. You miss this if it's all about making a difference. I'm going to be seen as somehow successful. I beg you, if the Spirit of God is in you, just be available at the most basic level for God to use you 
in ministering to those that he confronts you with. And you will build the sweetest relationships. I've learned something in life, you know, that my brothers and sisters in Christ are closer to me even than people that I'm related to by blood. I find that I can have a closer relationship with people who simply want to do the will of my Father in heaven. Have you encountered that yet? Have you experienced it? Praise the Lord. And finally, our last point here today, final point, the last temptation, quickly, we're going to be over time again, our last temptation in verses uh, 8 through 10. The devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to them, all these things will I give you if you fall down and worship me. That's the bottom line, isn't it? That's what he's wanted all along. From the moment he stood there as the covering cherub in heaven, and he watched the Father and the Son go into their little meeting about the creation of this earth, from that moment on he was filled with envy, covetousness, jealousy, he saw the adoration that Jesus was receiving. And he said in his own heart, I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I'll be up there. I will be worshipped. I will receive homage. And he could have had it all, you know. Who was closer to the throne in heaven? Who could have fallen down on his face every single day and taken hold of the feet of the Father and Jesus and said, I'm overwhelmed by the plan that you guys have come up with. It is so generous. It's so redemptive. It's so love-motivated. I adore you, even to considering leaving heaven and taking on the likeness of sinful human flesh, being treated as a guilty sinner in order to reconcile the world unto yourself. He could have had all that, and he could have just prayed. He could have let his praise flow. It would have resounded throughout heaven, you know. Instead, and this is the temptation, this is a big one, I'm sorry we're running out of time now because this is the temptation to seek power. I want to tell you something, it's killing many of our churches. It's killing our churches. People are seeking position and power without the qualifications of Christ in them. How deadly that is. How deadly it is. And timid souls get crushed. People with a vision for ministry get wounded and discouraged and move to a different church. Just because somebody is seeking for power itself rather than falling down on their faces and saying, worthy, worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and glory and power. And strength, all of these things belong to him, not to us. And anybody who is seeking power is unfit for spiritual leadership, but we keep voting them into leadership in churches. And I want to tell you, I've seen churches literally destroyed because of this horrendous power struggle that goes on. I've seen precious souls wounded. Wounded to death. By the way, a great author, Henry Nguyen, N O U W E N. A great author made a profound statement in his book, In the Name of Jesus. Powerful book. He makes the statement, he says, that the temptation of power is greatest when intimacy is a threat. I've pondered that for a long time. 
What he's really saying is people who are unable to give and receive love and establish intimate interpersonal relationships are the ones that are drawn to power so they can control the lives of others. This, of course, is what happened in the Middle Ages when the church, which was called to reveal Jesus, turned itself into a papacy, controlling the lives of others. This is a huge thing here. I was going to tell a great story, but I can't tell it today. It'll have to wait till tomorrow morning, and it was a New Guinea story too. But <laughs> <laughs> the temptation to power, for power, is greatest when intimacy is a threat. And those who seek it are doing so in the name of the lowly, powerless Jesus who wouldn't even defend himself when confronted, who meekly submitted as a lamb to the slaughter. It's all done in his name. By the way, the guy that I've just recommended to you, you can shoot me later if you like, but he's a, he was, he's dead now, he's a Jesuit priest. And in this chapter in his book, he said, how can we, the Catholic Church, ever hope to fulfill the gospel commission when we have bishops riding around in chauffeured limousines, when we have magnificent churches worth millions of dollars, and we're doing it all in the name of the one who had nowhere to lay his own head. How can the Catholic Church, he says, ever fulfill the Gospel Commission. This was a man of God inside the Catholic Church. Another Martin Luther challenging his own church that if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you'll have humility of heart. You won't be seeking power. You will be seeking to function as a part of a beautiful body of believers who need one another in order to bring about the revelation of God. So as I conclude, what's our favorite word? Wow, three big things on the table here this morning. First one, the temptation to be self-sufficient, self-reliant. I've confessed my own need in this area. If you have truly wrestled stubbornly with your own self-sufficiency, your own self-reliance, and really struggled to place that reliance totally upon God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and to give God the glory because it's really Jesus in you, not you, I'm calling you to repentance this morning. If that's you, you should not be seated at the moment. You should be kneeling down in, in exactly where you are. You should be on your knees. Secondly, this morning, the temptation to be spectacular, to be successful, to being seen as somebody who's really made a difference. If that's your challenge, fall down on your knees in repentance this morning. And thirdly, huge thing here, the temptation for power. If you're motivated by a desire to control the lives of others, to seek position and power just for the sake of having it, and you're fearful of intimacy at the interpersonal level, I've got good news for you with Christ in your heart. You will not spend the rest of your life enslaved by that. You will learn what it means to be a shepherd or a shepherdess for the glory of God. You should be down on your knees at this moment too. Or if you're just sitting there this morning and these three huge points have no particular application to you, but you're saying to yourself, I need the attitude of Jesus when it comes to meeting temptation. I want the grace of God to say it is written. I want the grace of God not to struggle against the devil 
or against sin, but to put on Christ every day of my life, you should be on your knees too this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you alone are worthy, Father. You are worthy of our praise and our adoration. You alone have a heart of unselfish love. You alone are motivated by the best interests of others, never your own. You are always motivated, Father, with a desire to see people forgiven and restored and set free from slavery to sin. You were willing to come to this earth and take on the likeness of sinful flesh. You were willing to endure suffering persecution, even death, to demonstrate just what kind of love you really have. And Father, we fall down on our faces today in repentance and confess that we are so unlike you within ourselves, but our hope today is in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And as we go forth from this place today, send us forth in the name of Jesus, empowered, so that his beautiful character will shine forth through us and every day by faith as we come to the cross our old nature will be crucified afresh and we will live in newness of life so that Jesus can have his way with us and shape us into his very likeness. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you and responding to your love today. We rejoice as we leave in Jesus' precious name. Amen.